people lose their minds when parking is being discussed and proposed, right? And then once it's built, no one cares. No one monitors. The city doesn't monitor. No one even really knows how that parking is being managed once it's actually constructed. And that's where things fall apart. Because once it's constructed, typically it's not managed well. And that's why time and time again, when a developer goes to build their next building, they look at their prior construction, they see that they built 1.8 spots per unit, and they might even feel like that's not enough, and they might build more. Um, so the message is definitely that the first thing we should try is to ensure that parking is well managed. <laughs> Welcome to Reinventing Parking, the podcast about parking policy for anyone who wants a better city and better urban transport. Welcome back. I'm your host, Paul Barter. This time, my guest is someone with unique insights into the interface between the world of privately owned off-street parking and the world of parking policy reform. Evan Golden is co-founder and CEO of Parkade, a company on a mission to create a more livable, more affordable, more mobile world with far fewer parking spots. Or more specifically, Parkade provides an amazing app that makes it simple for buildings to better utilize their parking, for example, by making it really easy to share parking among tenants. And Evan is a really helpful presence in the Parking Reform Network Slack and I, I've, I've already learned a lot from him in the last couple of years, so I'm really happy to have him on the show and so that you can all learn from him too. And by the way, Parkade is also one of the first businesses to contribute to the Parking Reform Network as a sponsor. So let's get right into the conversation. Welcome to Reinventing Parking, Evan. Thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. Your your trajectory to get to this point as CEO of a, of a parking management assistance company how did you get to this point? What's the little backstory there? Um, like a lot of parking reformers, I would say my my journey began by reading Professor Shoup's book, The High Cost of Free Parking. Um, I picked up a copy probably in 2012, 2013 sometime and read it cover to cover and was absolutely just enthralled by the topic. And it really helped me see parking in a different light. And it helped me understand how core parking is to the way we get around, the way we design our cities. And it, it led at the time to a lot of interest in the topic at Lyft. I was one of the first team members of the ride sharing app Lyft. And we would often joke that our biggest competitor was not Uber. It was free parking. Uh, most people, instead of taking a Lyft, were choosing to drive themselves and park for free in the United States, not choosing to take an Uber. Uh, so there was a lot of discussion about parking and we were a bunch of kind of transportation and policy nerds. And so that topic really kept percolating with me and it percolated so much that in 2014, I, I had the crazy idea to volunteer to run the Lyft corporate parking lot. We had, we had just moved <clears throat> to this huge new office in San Francisco's Mission District we had about 60,000 square feet of office space. And suddenly we had something we never had before. We had parking. Uh, we previously didn't have any. And we had 250 employees, many of whom had cars. And we did the thing that most American companies do, which is <laughs> absolutely nothing with our parking. Uh, we just said, first come, first serve. It's free. You know, park wherever you want. And we very quickly discovered the downsides of doing that. And we had people fighting over parking spots. We had people driving to work that didn't need to drive, who lived half a mile away. We had people driving from farther away that had better alternatives, but didn't want to deal with street sweeping at home. So they would come park for free at work. And I volunteered to try to tame the madness and looked around and tried to see what kind of parking software was available for someone running a private parking lot. And really found that there wasn't much. And the stuff that was there was was pretty bad and unusable. That's quite a shock, isn't it? So you would think this is like there's thousands of companies in that position across the U.S. alone, let alone the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think parking, uh, some people just don't find it that interesting. And I really did. So 
we we didn't have any software at the time. We cobbled together spreadsheets and Facebook groups and Venmo. And I somehow convinced my CEO to let me start charging for parking at our own office. And we charged monthly. Um, we, we overshot the price, uh, made it a little too high. And we had a few vacant spots in the beginning, but we quickly adjusted the price. And <laughs> if you ever really felt want to feel like uh, you're on the hot seat, I suggest you announce to your coworkers at an all hands on stage that they're about to start paying for their own parking spots. Um, but we did that. We... Was anything thrown at you in that? Oh moment? yeah. Oh yeah. I had some popcorn <laughs> thrown at me. We had uh, some protesters pick at, pick at the meeting, uh, all oh, kinds boy. of stuff. Okay. But, uh, you know, Professor Shub wouldn't be surprised by this. It started to work. We rolled out paid parking and it worked really well. Suddenly parking was reliable. Uh, and these people that had been driving to work that had alternatives stopped driving to work and they started carpooling or they started partaking in the, the subsidy. We, we charged for parking and we gave that money to the people that didn't drive to work, essentially created our own transportation demand management system. Um, and it really shifted behavior. We had a huge drop off in the percent of people that drove alone. So, so that happened and I was kind of stewing on that at the same time. We had made parking reliable long term, but on a daily basis, there were a lot of people that were out of the office and spots were still sitting empty. So we kind of forced people to use Facebook group and offer their spot when they weren't in the office. And we were able to make parking more flexible and offer parking on a daily basis with that. And then the other thing that happened around that time is I was living in San Francisco in a high rise and my now wife uh, was commuting in from graduate school once or twice a week to come see me. And I lived in Knob Hill, a very parking-starved neighborhood of San Francisco, uh, but a, a neighborhood where parking meters are actually fairly rare. I did not have meters on my street, though we had them down the, down the street. Uh, and she came to visit and on one particular occasion that's seared in my memory, drove around my block for about 25 minutes on a Friday night after a really tough week of exams and studying and called me exasperated in tears and said, said the words, I've been searching for parking for 30 minutes. I haven't found anything. I'm never coming to visit you again. And that <laughs> was a terrible experience. And, uh, you know, I feared yeah. for my romantic Just, life. It was, it was yes. pretty scarring. Parking management people out there who are listening, this is important stuff. You are threatening people's <laughs> romantic futures if you don't manage your parking properly. That's exactly right. It's, That's exactly right. She would have paid. She would have happily paid to get to Evan. <laughs> yep. That was that was a key lesson. And, and so I ran downstairs. I ran through the parking garage to go meet her and grab her car and try to park for her. And I ran through the parking garage and noticed that there were at least 50 empty parking spots. And I was living in this big, you know, multifamily building, and I realized I had no way to get short-term parking. There were tons of empty spots, some owned by the building, some, you know, leased by other residents, but there was no way to share. So that really stuck with me, and it stuck with me so much that a couple of years later, I left my job and uh, started Parkade to try to solve this problem full-time, and now we work with hundreds of apartment and office communities around the world, most in the United States, and are really helping to ensure that none of the buildings are making the mistakes that, that those early you know, offices and apartments I saw in, in person uh, did in the early okay. 2010s. What, what year was that that Parkade got started? Uh, we started in 2018. Okay, so it's a, it's a pretty new company, but already doing reasonably well and uh, growing. Yeah, we've been growing, uh, growing like crazy, and it's just, <laughs> you know, amazing when people hear the idea. They're just absolutely delighted because no one on the property management side loves dealing with parking. It's everyone's least favorite part of their job, and the idea that they can modernize it, reduce their workload, increase their own building's revenue, and make for happier residents, it's a huge win for everybody. So you handle uh, residential buildings, but you also handle office buildings and uh, any other kinds of buildings? Really, our focus is any building that has private off-street parking. There are, of course, many buildings in the United States that fall into that category, but don't have any interest in managing their parking. Maybe they're an ex-urban garden-style community that's just super over-parked. 
but there are lots of other buildings like the one I lived in that are starved for gas parking where parking is very limited nearby. And so it could be, you know, uh, an office, a school, we work with a retirement home, um, all kinds of different places. Uh, but apartments and condos are really our, our primary customers. You, you've hinted at how dysfunctional the management of off-street parking typically was and is in many buildings. You've said most of them don't manage it at all, uh, which for many of them may be not a problem. But how is it done currently in the group of buildings that really need Parkade or, or, or a company like Parkade but are not using it currently? How are they currently doing it and why is that all going wrong? Most buildings that manage their parking are using, at best, a spreadsheet. To do it. So the Main Street Apartments, you know, ex- theoretical example building is managed by some property manager and they ha- probably have a parking spreadsheet that they inherited from their previous property manager. It's really old. It's probably out of date. Uh, because they're managing parking with a spreadsheet, they have no ability to offer short-term parking. It's only long-term parking that's offered at the property, which means guests need to park on the street only. Um, They're probably dealing with a lot of enforcement issues that they've tried to solve with very, call them kludgy methods. Uh, We see stickers and decals and hang tags and all kinds of crazy methods that rely on paper. We see a lot of buildings, the, the only parking enforcement tool they have in their tool belt is to tow a car. So a lot of residents, you know, you Get, you get a rental car for a weekend because you want an upgrade or your car is in the shop. You forget your decal in your primary car. You come home and because your building uses decals, your car gets towed. Uh, those are you know, the kinds of experiences that a lot of multifamily residents are going to be pretty used to. And, and it's one of the reasons that the solution for the last few decades to make parking better has just been to overbuild it. When I talk to developers... They want to ensure that they have enough parking for their residents and their guests. Um, And so much of the reason for that is just poor subpar management. So bottom line, a lot of the episodes of this podcast and a lot of the messaging from Parking Reform Network is aimed at, say, cities with their similar tendency to, on the other side of the uh, regulatory fence, telling buildings you must provide excessive parking, huge amounts of parking, because we find it inconvenient, difficult, politically awkward to manage our parking, the on-street parking primarily, as well as our other public parking. But then on the other side of the fence, even if cities uh, stopped requiring parking, which more and more are, which is a good thing, too many buildings and building uh, developers who are talking to the building managers and hear their problems will hear, we still want lots of parking because we're afraid to manage our parking because managing parking is a terrible hassle, a uh, great headache. And so the bottom line message here is, no, managing your parking can be easy. It can be actually a, a revenue source. We can help you. Don't spend enormous amounts of money, waste enormous amounts of space, build fewer office floors and fewer residential floors than you could have done because you're afraid to manage your parking. It's a crazy, crazy solution. The solution is manage your parking. And you yeah. Know, engage a company like Parkade. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's been crazy f- to see how much, and, and the, you know, the parking reform network and community knows this story well, but people lose their minds when parking is being discussed and proposed, right? And then once it's built, no one cares. No one monitors. The city doesn't monitor. No one even really knows how that parking is being managed once it's actually constructed. And that's where things fall apart, because once it's constructed, typically it's not managed well. And that's why time and time again, when a developer goes to build their next building, they look at their prior construction, they see that they built 1.8 spots per unit, and they might even feel like that's not enough, and they might build more. Um, So the message is definitely that the first thing we should try is to ensure that parking is well managed. I've seen cities, as an example of this, really overestimate how well parking is managed and how much parking demand there is. My own hometown of Palo Alto commissioned a study years ago where they went around to various multifamily buildings in Palo Alto to survey peak parking demand. 
the consultant found that the peak parking demand, if I recall, was around 60% in a lot of these communities. It was a mix of affordable senior housing market rate. And even in the, the densest of communities, even the market rate communities, parking demand had been way overestimated and they were seeing 40% vacancy, so 60% utilization. And this came back to council as they were debating parking minimums and <laughs> council literally didn't believe the parking consultant. And the parking consultant had to sit there saying, no, I personally visited these buildings at 11 p.m. on a Tuesday. I, I saw 40% vacancy. And the politician said, no, you must be wrong. You must be incorrect. You must have miscounted because the residents nearby always complain about parking. Surely this building has way more parking demand than that. And they didn't. The problem is that when the rubber meets the road, uh, so, so to speak, in the parking lot, it's not managed well. And, and residents and guest parking needs are often not met. And, and that's what really needs to change. And that's what we're trying to change. Yeah, yeah. And it, there is a problem in the street. It's just that people trying to park in the street just don't have access or they don't have easy access to that off-street parking. So it's even worse. The, the usual situation is the off-street is priced and that encourages people to try to park for free in the street. Exactly. The we see that all the time. Yeah. 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 Yep. But then the other the other aspect is that you're, you're familiar with is buildings with all sorts of access restrictions and especially office buildings and residential buildings it's like that. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, an, an enormous failure. And as you said, people just don't really monitor what's going on. And so they don't understand. Even the people who deal with this every week at their council meetings who should perhaps understand don't understand. Yeah, oh, goodness. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. People wonder, how can people in our movement get so obsessed about parking and find it so fascinating? On a weekly basis, it hits me again, like just how can it be that there's this arena of public policy that is so mind-bogglingly mismanaged and yeah. just so badly done? It's just such low-hanging fruit to do better. And yet, it's such a struggle to convince people to do better. So yeah. it's, it's frustrating, but it's also fascinating. Well, and I think <laughs> Professor Shoup was the one I want to credit who said, Something along along the lines of when it you know comes to urban urban issues, I mean parking is the lowest hanging fruit. There, there's so much that is relatively easy relative to other policy changes or um, just other changes to be made that parking really is is so much easier to improve upon than so many other problems. So let, let's think about the kind of needs of a parking manager for a building. And that sounds like a glorious term, but it's, it, it could just be the, the building manager trying to handle parking on a part-time basis and thinking he'll be able to do it half an hour per week and then getting frustrated when it eats up half of his time or her time. One of the problems with off-street parking as a whole is that it is run by a slew of people for whom parking is a very low priority, right? If you're an apartment manager, you're managing a building of 300 units, or you're managing an office building, it's, it's not your first priority. Your first priority is making sure your apartments are leased. Uh, if you're managing an apartment building, if you're in an office building, it's making sure your offices are leased. The parking exists very much for these folks as a loss leader, right? As a, as a way that the apartments get rented, as a way that the office gets rented. And, and you see that because many of these buildings don't even have any parking, right? You, a, a building can often get by sometimes just fine without any on-site parking because maybe there's a public parking garage across the street. So parking is managed by these apartment managers, the office building managers, for whom, you know, they are not trained parking professionals. They are, you know, trained and very good usually at other things um, and, you know, excellent at budgeting and excellent at maintenance and, and many other things. But parking is really an afterthought for them. And, th and that's why I think we've really found so much success because we, they're able to offload a lot of that thinking a lot of that handling of parking to us um, and we make it, you know, self-serve and, and really are able to offload all the work from the property team. Um, so it, it works much better for them. But, you know, we can't be too surprised that parking is not nearly as efficient as it could be when, you know, the, the local property manager gets a ton of discretion. To my frustration, my own office building where Parkade headquarters is in San Francisco, I've seen this same thing. We, we have uh, a huge parking lot, more than 60 parking spots in the Mission District, and they are fully leased. 
there's every single spot is taken. My team is constantly parking on the street and parking, of course, is free in our neighborhood on the street. And my team will circle for, you know, 10, 20 minutes sometimes trying to find parking. And I've gone to the building and I've said, hey, we should really have a system for this. You should really use Parkade. Uh, and the, the property manager has looked back at me and said, I don't see the problem. The, uh, every spot is leased. I said, I know, but you're, my team can't park every day. I come to the office and two thirds of the spots are empty because people don't come into the office anymore. And, you know, they just don't see the problem. Um, so, you know, we really want to help those people and, and help them see the light. Right. Yes. Yes. So parking is always someone else's problem. So this parking podcast, we, we usually focused on parking reform, uh, all around the world and Parkade is an interesting company in that you have taken an interest in the world of parking reform. In, in addition to sort of having this business where you're helping private sector owners of parking manage their parking better and easier and more profitably. Uh, but you, you very clearly see the link with parking reform. And so could you reflect on that a little bit, really? What, what led you there? And also, do you have anything to say to the rest of the parking, private sector parking industry, you know, companies that are doing similar things to yourself or companies that are offering, um, you know, equipment and management services for buildings, you know, access control, all of that stuff? Should, should they be taking more interest in the parking reform movement? dare I say, even sponsoring the Parking Reform Network. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, yes. As the first sponsor, I would definitely agree. I think that the parking world should love parking reform. The way parking works at a societal level is is honestly pretty terrible today. Parking is extreme. I mean, you ask most people about parking and their, their brain usually wants to explode. Parking should be easy. It, it doesn't have to be hard for that to be the case. You know, we need to manage parking better. We need to price it better. But I, I really think the industry itself should be interested in a, a world where there's a lot fewer parking spaces, but it's easier to park. That's really the, the world we're trying to create, right? Instead of having an apartment building, I'm looking at a, you know, a schematic right in front of me on my desk. And instead of, you know, having an apartment building with 2,040 parking spots and 1,200 units, we should, you know, have a building that's got 1,200 units and 1,300 parking spots, or even better, 1,800 units and 1,300 parking spots. And that's only possible if if we as an industry come together and and really ensure that things are getting better better managed. And if, perhaps if policymakers, you know, continue to push on the levers that they can push on. I, to, to also answer the question, I would say one other thing, which is that I think. Parkade specifically is very aligned with parking reform in large part because what we're doing is applying Shupian principles to off-street parking, right? Donald Shoup always speaks to the need to right price parking. That's exactly what we're doing for off-street. So, you know, when you, when you have a property manager who's got 80 different tasks, charging the right price for parking and even potentially charging any price for parking is pretty low on their priority list. We run into building after building where they say, I don't want to charge. Every other building around here doesn't charge. I don't want to be the first. Doesn't make sense. We, we make it very easy for buildings to charge for parking because they don't have to do any work in doing so. And if they want to ration it, they want to offer one spot per unit. And then the second spot is you know, $100 and the third spot is $200. We, we offer tools to make that stuff very easy. So we're helping buildings unbundle and right price parking. We're also improving parking just, availability. Just, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just let me, jump, let me jump in there because that's actually very interesting, right? One, one, one of the um, things 30 years ago where, or 40 years ago when Shoop was sort of getting going, it, it was either, it was zero, zero or 100%. It's, it's, it was hard to phase in pricing. And similarly, off street, right? It's such a hassle to set up the pricing system, whereas you're making it easy to take that little step in a little way. And so it's not so much hassle, which I, I guess makes it easier to take that first step. But would you say that's, that's, that's one of the keys? Yeah, we're, we're helping. We're definitely helping people dip their toe in the water of right pricing, right? I'm, I'm talking to a building in a, a large apartment complex in Colorado that comes to mind where they know, so they're running out of parking. They're getting constant complaints about parking, guests can't park. They don't ever offer any guest parking, but they don't really manage their parking. It's just first come, first serve, unassigned parking. They don't charge a thing. And we are working with them to start charging just $15 a month and set a limit on how many parking spots people can have at that price. 
and then after that, you know, you you get uh, more spots, and they know that people, ha- some people there have four or five spots, four, four or five cars, and they haven't moved in months. They're using it for car st- long term car storage because it's so underpriced. So we're we're helping them dip their toe in the water, and then at the same time we're offering very sophisticated tools where if you want to have you know if you want to give residents thirty hours per month of guest parking, great. The next thirty hours is X price. The next hundred hours is Y price. Uh, we can offer uh, a mix of hybrid public and private parking. So if they want to offer some parking areas to the public, some maintain just for residents that's fine even when with gates um so a lot of really interesting and sophisticated scenarios if you're ready to do more than just tip your toe in but we're definitely helping them right price their parking yeah yeah people are so afraid of scarcity but why are they afraid because then there'll be the hassle of managing parking if the managing the parking is easy we don't need to be so afraid of scarcity but on the other other side of the coin, getting back to that question of the parking industry and um, why parking industry should be interested in parking reform instead of thinking of parking reform as some kind of enemy, anti-parking kind of enemy, which some people in the parking industry seem to think about it like that, which is a bit, it strikes me as weird because if you look at a city, any city, the most intense parking management industry activity is all the areas where there's some scarcity of parking or a lot of scarcity, but e- even a little bit of scarcity creates frustration with parking, which then creates the need for entrepreneurs such as yourself to step in and help. And the good news is you can help. <laughs> it's yeah. not that hard. And no, you know, it's, it's not no, such a disaster. Scarcity. And I guess part of my point is scarcity very much depends on how you manage your parking. I, I think about this, the, this building we launched in Koreatown, a, neighbor, a very parking starved neighborhood in Los Angeles. And when we launched there, and took over parking management, um, they had a wait list of, I believe, about 18 parking spots for long-term parking. So residents were literally moving into the building and being told, I don't know when you're going to get a parking spot, weeks, months, don't know. And we went in, we audited all the parking, we uh, made sure that it was priced correctly, we found people that had moved out that were still assigned parking, we found people that were supposed to be paying for parking that had not been paying, that once they were told they actually needed to pay, dropped their parking lease. We found all kinds of things. And uh, we also were able to offer parking short term. So the people that were renting parking spots just so their girlfriend could come over once a week, we were able to combine four, five, six, seven of those people, uh, help them drop their parking leases and just rent parking short term when they need it. And we allow for very easy subleasing. So through all those methods, we were able to take them from an 18 spot uh, shortfall to a, I think about an eight spot surplus. And so in that scenario, <laughs> scarcity was, I don't want to say it was imagined, but it was self-inflicted. And that, that is a solvable problem. And it, it's, it's such a shame because those are the, you know, the residents of that building before Parkade, if there was another apartment complex being proposed down the street, they're probably the ones going to city hall picketing saying, no, 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 I don't want my street parking to get any tougher. But that was, again, just a result of management that could have been far better. A lot of building managers are uh, worried about this whole issue of uh, electric vehicle charging and uh, how to manage that that issue of sharing those, those, those charging spots and, you know, the investment is a pretty big upfront investment, so they they don't want to overbuild EV parking spots and um, charging stations as well. And does Parkade help with that? We do. We open up a few options. I mean, one is we allow any chargers that are in assigned parking spots to be subleased. So rather than just you know only being used by the party that's renting or being assigned that spot, it can be shared among many people. Um, We also allow for EV chargers to be communal and reserved in advance, which is really helpful because, you know, any EV driver will tell you they have real range anxiety, and it's very important for them to know that they can get home and charge. And when you just do first come, first serve for your EV charging banks, there's no predictability, and you end up creating a Tesla parking lot where because it's unmonitored, that Tesla is going to sit there for days on end, not moving, and you you really are going to see subpar charger utilization. And it's been great. I actually have an EV myself, and I do not have a charger in my assigned parking spot at home. 
when I need to charge, I open Parkade, I reserve a neighbor spot in the building, and they have a great system called EverCharge. So I already have my fob. It's billed directly, the electricity is billed directly to me. I just pay a couple bucks to borrow a spot and I'm able to charge my car. And so we're able, my building's able to get by with a lot fewer chargers. I think what's super interesting about EVs, EV charging, is it's a microcosm of parking. We are repeating a lot of the same mistakes that we have made with parking for 50 years of over, you know, overbuilding parking, poor utilization, poor management. Uh, and we can't be surprised that we're going to see the same results with EV charging, that we're going to need way too many chargers. We're going to have cities insisting you need, you know, EV minimums. And we're going to see that I've already seen the spread of that. I met with a developer today who said the city insists on 40% of the spots having EV chargers. That is a massive expense if every building yes, has to do yes. that. And the solution, much like parking reform is pushing with parking, should just be better charger utilization. We shouldn't have to put a charger in every spot. It's going to take trillions of dollars. Fascinating. We've already talked about a key thing the cities can, should, uh, must do is abolish the parking mandates. That would A, not be a problem, but B, would help in many, many ways. And the scarcity that may eventually emerge in some areas is easily managed, as you've persuaded us. The on-street part is their problem. They can manage that. The off-street part, your problem, you can manage that. But what, what other city policies would you say are really important for uh, making things better in general? And your business interacts in some way with these policy changes, which would be a good thing for everybody. For example, um, unbundling, is that, is that a big issue for you? Yeah. Um, unbundling is huge. I mean, I think that when you think about policy changes that can and should be made uh, that I would say is near the top of the list for, for me. And I happen to live in California, which just passed a new unbundling law statewide. So AB 1317 goes into effect in 2025 and it requires market rate pricing of parking. So unbundled parking in uh, all new construction in about half of the new multifamily that will get built in the state. So super, super impactful. And it's impactful because I said this before, but nobody wants to go first when it comes to unbundling. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with developers who say, I want to charge for parking. I know that there's overconsumption of parking. I know I don't need this much parking, but I'm scared to do it because all of my comps, all of my similar buildings nearby do not charge for parking. And until they charge for parking, I can't charge for parking because that's going to scare people off from a, a lease. And I can't lose an entire lease over a you know, $50, $100 parking charge. So regulation to just ensure that everyone is at least charging something is certainly a great place to start. Honestly, <laughs> charging anything is a big step up from charging nothing. Even $5, 10 $15 a month we've seen be enough to deter someone who does not at all need a parking spot from, from getting or keeping that parking spot. Or it's enough Interesting. to give them a discount. I spoke with the, the developer I met with today in Southern California, who I think I convinced to start charging for parking, said they're going to discount their rents the same level that they add parking charges. So their rents were $3,400 a month today. I think it was for a two bedroom. And they were going to start charging $200 for parking. And that was going to allow them to lower their asking rent by $200. So they get to advertise lower prices. The people that don't own cars get to actually feel the discounted price of not using their parking. Uh, and, the, and the building gets to see much lower parking demand as a result. So ev everybody wins um, at the end of the day. Just getting back to the, like, the core of um, Donald Shoup thought, <laughs> uh, abolish the parking mandates, ration the parking, share the, share the revenue. Do, do, do you have any of that sharing the revenue on the off-street side with you know, residents who are initially or, or office building managers and employees who are initially reluctant to, to engage in rationing with pricing? Um, is there sometimes some sort of sharing of the benefits to sweeten the deal? Yes, definitely. And I've seen it in all different types of buildings. So, you know, at Lyft, we collected, I think it was around $15,000 a month in parking fees. And as I mentioned, we took that money and then just gave it to the people that didn't drive to work. So we were not only imposing a stick, but giving people a carrot. 
And when we when we saw how instrumental that was to to parking behavior change, it was massive. Not only facing the the fear of paying one hundred seventy five dollars a month to park, but missing out on seventy dollars or seventy five dollars a month in subsidies or bonuses if you didn't drive was huge. So you know we've seen it in offices on the residential side. We have a slew of buildings that take the money that they collect and deliver it right back to residents. A classic example is a condo building. We help condo buildings monetize their parking if they want to. Um, and for those, that direct, they already have a mechanism to do that. That goes directly to their HOA fees. So we've seen multiple buildings lower their HOA assessments or fees just because they're managing their parking better. Um, and that's been extremely impactful. So it's, yeah, it's, been, it's been very helpful. We also allow for easy subleasing. So we make it easy for these folks with long-term parking to actually just make money from their spot. And it goes right back into their pocket. So it's, you know, even directly at the individual Parker level, there's a reward from putting your spot to better use. And that's money that people can then spend on, you know, whatever they see fit. So we've definitely created, a, you know, a bit of the, the third arm of, you know, Shupian policies of off-street parking benefit districts. When you're hustling for business. I, I guess you're targeting buildings with parking problems. I wonder, do you, do you also reach out to, to, the, to the developers? If we could persuade developers that, look, once you've finished your building, it will still be leasable. You'll still be able to sell it on because companies like Parkade exist and you don't need as much parking as you thought you did. Do you think that that message is perhaps seeping through into the development industry that they don't need as much parking as they thought they did? Yeah, it, I, I, it's happening. I would, I will say, and I will admit, it's happening slowly. Um, developers are building a lot less parking in the last few years than they used to. That is an experiment that is slow to draw conclusions, right? They were talking about long development cycles, um, things that take many years to get approved and then built and then tested, and so the the speed at which developers can learn is unfortunately fairly slow. And I think that's that's where we as parking advocates can help. We can encourage the city to set policy like parking maximums. We can encourage cities to unbundle parking, which was probably the, the greatest single tool to reduce parking demand. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it will be kind of on developers to know that they can get by with less. And we're trying to help them show that, right? The story is like that building in Koreatown that had you know a huge shortfall in parking and then a surplus just with better parking management. It was a 27% parking utilization increase. Hopefully, I know stories like that are helping the developers we work with shave their parking ratios, even 10%. And that's you know a huge, huge impact to the climate in our cities. But it is a, you know, a slow moving pace of change. Um, but I do think that elimination of parking minimums is, is making a huge difference. We have a, a customer actually in uh, my hometown of Palo Alto that proposed a building with, I think, about 50 units and, and 30 parking spots. It was workforce housing near transit. And the city required that they build twice as much parking as they wanted. They only wanted 30 parking spots. My hometown of Palo Alto, a supposed climate champion, made them build 60. And now, uh, years later, the building is done, it's opened, and they have, I believe, 31 parking spots that have been leased. So they are sitting <laughs> about half empty, and they had to, at a cost of uh, multiple millions of dollars, I think $2 million, they had to install parking stackers. So this parking cannot really be shared with the public. It is very difficult for guests to use. And the only reason they had to spend money on parking stackers and delay construction a month was because the city made them do that. So, you know, parking minimum reform is an extremely effective first step, but there's much more we need to do. And, and hopefully, you know, developers will, will see the light fairly quickly. Earlier on, you mentioned uh, cities are flying blind because they, they have no idea about the utilization rates of, of street parking. And so Palo Alto will never learn its lesson unless you tell them. <laughs> uh, maybe the parking reform movement should add one more item to our agenda, which is mandating reporting of parking utilization rates to accelerate this understanding of the, the enormous glut that we've got in so many cities. Paul, that's the best idea I have heard in a very long time. I love it. And it's exactly <laughs> right. Paul, I, I guarantee you that if you went to the city council that forced this developer to dip, build twice as much parking and you asked them how much parking was being used, they would have no idea. 
And so I absolutely love that idea, right? Or tell a city, if you're going to require parking still, you then need to do parking analysis and you need to stay on top of this data because that's exactly right. That is how developers learn quickly is if this is if this data is available and collected and they can be shown that you don't actually need that much parking. So I, I, I think that's a absolutely fantastic idea and hopefully those <laughs> listening uh, can take an interest. Maybe that's a great place to end. We've taken a lot of your time and uh, you've got a very important meeting coming up. Uh, with the president of the Parking Reform Network by just by coincidence. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I have so, drinks yeah. drinks with Tony. It's all parking all, all the time around here. Yes. And it's th Thanksgiving week in the US and the Parking Reform Network has a lot of a lot to give thanks for. We've had a great year. Say hello to Tony for all of us. <laughs> I will. And we will, we will toast to Parking Reform. Thanks very much for being on the uh, podcast, Evan. Fabulous. Thank you, Paul. You've been listening to the Reinventing Parking podcast, and I'm Paul Barter. You can find out more at reinventingparking.org, where you'll find ideas and tips on parking policy. You can also listen to other episodes, subscribe, or leave a comment. That's reinventingparking.org. Bye for now.